This is Standing Watch. And now, Evangelist Norbert Link. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to our Standing Watch program. America is sick, Egypt is in turmoil, and beware of false prophets. That's pretty much a summary of what I'm going to talk to you about today. Not too long ago, Der Spiegel Online, a German magazine, wrote the following. America is sick. September 11 left it wounded and unsettled. That's been obvious for nearly 12 years. But we are only now finding out just how grave the illness really is. Now, when I read this comment, I immediately thought of the Bible. I thought of a scripture in the book of Isaiah, in the first chapter, where God says that the whole nation is sick, talking about the modern descendants of the house of Israel. And as you know, when you have been listening to our programs, we have been proclaiming for years or decades or even centuries, when I say we, I'm talking about the Church of God, that the United States of America is a descendant of the ancient house of Israel. It was interesting to me to hear that Glenn Beck recently agreed with that and also stated that, in fact, America is a descendant of the ancient house of Israel. And he is absolutely correct in that regard. Now, why is America sick? And how does the sickness affect, for instance, Egypt, our policy towards Egypt? Now, I'd like to quickly read to you from an article which was published in the Washington Post saying, that Senator Rand Paul, who was writing, had been trying to convince the government and his colleagues to stop sending military aid and financial aid to Egypt. And he did this as early as July 12, 2013. Nobody, neither the government, nor the Republicans, nor the Democrats were willing to agree with that. They refused to call it a coup, which under the law would have stopped payments. And now, now we find that they were too sick to see the handwriting on the wall. In fact, they were suffering from illusions and hallucinations so that they didn't even see the wall or the handwriting. Notice an article by CableForeignPolicy.com on August 15. Senator Rand Paul is hammering his fellow senators for keeping billions in financial aid flowing to Egypt's military, even as Cairo security forces massacre anti-government activists. This is something that those who voted in Congress and also in the House and the Senate, actually, are going to have to live with, Paul said. The question is, how does their conscience feel now as they see photographs of tanks rolling over Egyptian civilians? A good question. Now, some are bad paddling. Some are now suddenly talking about that, oh, well, the policy of Mr. Obama was a failure. The same ones who supported it. For instance, Senator John McCain is listed in that regard. Now, the Spiegel Online wrote on August 14 that horribly battered corpses line the streets and there are more than 1,000 injured. It's many more by now. The government sought to bring calm to Cairo, but of course they did just the opposite. Notice this statement. Residents fear a war between two Egypts. Do you know that the Bible prophesied that a long time ago? War between Egyptians? You can find that in Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 2, where you read that Egyptians will be fighting against Egyptians. Something which we have told you when the Arab Spring began. We have a free booklet on Middle Eastern nations and African nations and Bible prophecy. You can ask for a copy. That was written a long time ago, telling you exactly what is happening now and telling you exactly what is going to happen in the future. And I'm warning you right now, don't listen to those false prophets who give you false biblical ideas, which are not coming from the Bible. The Christian Science Monitor also describes the sickness of the policy of America in these terms, dated August 14. Since a military coup that ousted the Muslim Brotherhood's Mohammed Morsi from the Egyptian's presidency on July 3, the Obama administration has been over 
has been has bent over backwards not to call it a coup, because if they had, they would have had to stop payments. While emissaries from Obama danced around the coup questions, U.S. government refused to announce a cutoff in the Egyptian's military $1.3 billion annual subsidy. These decisions led to odd rhetorical constraints constructions from the U.S. government, as when State Department spokeswoman Jen Psaki was pressed last week on whether the Obama administration thought Egypt's military had carried out a coup. That's what she said. We have determined that we do not need to make a determination. Well, the article goes on that the military now made that determination for America, and that America has found to be absolutely helpless sitting at the sideline and not doing anything, not having any respect, not having any influence like a sick man wouldn't have. He's too sick to act. The Bible has told you this thousands of years ago. It goes on to say in this article, it's a truism then that you cannot please everybody, but in the case of Egypt, the U.S. has pleased precisely no one. Even the New York Times added the following on August 14. For Mr. Obama, who was wrapping up a round of golf, as Mr. Kerry stepped before the cameras, the upheaval in Egypt put him in an awkward but familiar place on vacation, confronting a wave of bloodshed in the Middle East. And then they say that America has very little leverage in regards to the events over there anyhow. Now, later on, The press reported, like the NBC News on August 15, that Mr. Obama then strongly condemned the violence, and they called his vacation a working vacation. A working vacation, if you have heard that term before. Now, the Washington Post wrote on August 15, put it this way, President Obama's Egypt policy is about as effective as his Syria policy. Obama was briefed, said nothing, went back to golf. Secretary of State John Kerry took a break break from his fruitless obsession with the non-existent peace process to condemn the violence, but took no questions, had no policy announcement. This, in a nutshell, is the White House approach to the Middle East, the absence of any policy, and a lot of empty words, like a sick person would behave. Now, the Huffington Post most certainly a left liberal magazine, wrote this on August 15 when they talked about Mr. Obama's condemnation. They had the following headline. We strongly condemn attacks that we are paying for. Showing the hypocrisy, showing the fruitlessness of the American policy and diplomacy, not just towards Egypt, but pretty much towards every other country around the world. Der Spiegel Online, a strong supporter of Mr. Obama when he was elected, now started to attack him by saying he is failing to take a clear position on the conflict. He has proven himself to be powerless. The perhaps strongest condemnation I found was published by the editorial board of the Washington Post on August 14. I'd like to quickly read some of it to you. It says, Before the July 3 coup in Egypt, the Obama administration privately warned the armed forces against ousting the government of Mohamed Morsi, pointing to U.S. legislation that requires a cutoff of aid to any country where the army plays a decisive role in removing an elected government. Yet when the generals ignored the U.S. warnings, the White House responded by electing to disregard the law itself after a prolonged and embarrassing delay. And by the way, mind you, the majority of the Democrats and Republicans supported that concept. So after a prolonged and embarrassing delay, the State Department announced that it had chosen not to determine whether a coup had taken place. And Secretary of State John uh, John F. Kerry declared that Egypt's military was restoring democracy. Because of those decisions, the Obama administration is complicit, they are saying, complicit, responsible, at least partially, in the new and horrifyingly bloody crackdown. Now, that's a strong statement. Here's a sick man 
who by his sickness and through his sickness has become responsible for the murder of many, many people. Now, let me just say, the Muslim Brotherhood are not an innocent party in this either. They are provoking violence, of course. They are two sides fighting against each other, none of which is right, none of which is just or righteous. But through the incredibly stupid policy of the American government and its supporters, it didn't help. It didn't help. And now we are still sending military aid and financial aid, helping those to crack down on others, like we have supported Saddam Hussein in the past, like we have supported Osama bin Laden in the past, only that they are turning around and have turned around to become our enemies. That has been the American policy for I don't know how long. God condemns it strongly in his words, saying you are trying to buy allies and you are not looking at me for help and security and protection. That's why America is sick. And it's not going to be restored to soundness. I can guarantee you that. So they are saying that America was complicit in this bloodshed which we are experiencing in Egypt and which we will continue to experience. Now, what does the Bible actually say about these things? I already quoted one scripture about Egyptian fighting against Egyptians. Now, some are saying, well, you know, there's going to be a seven-year contract and the Europeans will have a seven-year contract with the Arab nations, including Egypt. And then after three and a half years, they will break that contract, invade the Middle East, and do away with the sacrifices which the Jews will have started. You know, the Bible doesn't say anything of that sort. You know, I mean, you're listening to these kind of pronunciations and pronouncements, and you are being misled. The Bible doesn't give you any time elements. When it talks about the seven-year contract, they are referring to Daniel chapter 9. That's not talking about any contract between nations. It's talking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who will be cut off in the middle of the week. He was literally crucified on a Wednesday, and he was in the grave three days and three nights, as he has said he would be. And he was resurrected on Saturday evening, just before sunset, fulfilling the only sign he gave to the Pharisees that he was the Messiah. Has nothing to do with a contract between nations in the end time. By his death, he did away with the old covenant and thereby with the need to give animal sacrifices to restore a relationship with God. He was the supreme sacrifice. That's what that scripture is talking about. Now, there are scriptures which are saying that there is going to be some kind of a collaboration or confederacy between Europe and some nations. Originally, there is going to be some kind of a collaboration between Europe and Germany in particular, and nations such as Egypt and Libya and Ethiopia. So watch Ethiopia. But then we also find that another confederacy is going to be brought about between Europe and Germany in particular and some Arab nations, but they don't include Egypt or Libya or Ethiopia. So it appears like that that former collaboration will stop. And then finally, we do find that Europe will invade the Middle East. And Egypt and Ethiopia and Libya will be conquered by Europe. But the other nations, which Psalm 83 talks about, these Arab nations, they will escape. That's what the Bible tells you. You can check up on us. We have been preaching this for many, many years. Our free booklet I have mentioned on uh, the prophecies regarding Middle Eastern nations and African nations tells you this. Don't be deceived by those who give you wrong information. Keep listening to our programs because that's where you find the truth. And I dare to say, I don't know of any other program which is similar to the ones we are presenting you on a weekly basis. So thank you very much for listening. This is Norbert Link for the Standing Watch program. Standing Watch is a presentation by The Church of the Eternal God. P.O. Box 270519, San Diego, California, 92198. More information is also available at our website, eternalgod.org.